Um, you know, come out and do a great job. Thanks for all the announcements, too. Looking for some good events coming up. So we appreciate y'all having us. Um, I hope uh, I hope you don't mind, Tom. I had some information. There's a lot of germane stuff coming up about the Bill of Rights in the last few months that we've been dealing with. A lot of history, a lot of things has kind of impacted the country that's related to this. So if it's hard to give permission, I'd like to kind of expand a little bit on some of those things with the Bill of Rights and kind of bring a little bit of stuff out and maybe go into it a little bit deeper. Uh, what I'd like to do uh, before we start, and again, y'all y'all forgive me. I apologize in advance to the cameraman because I'm kind of used to lecturing to a lot of my college students. I used to teach college classes at night, and I'm a judge during the day. And so what I do is I pace back and forth. I hope I didn't get on your nerves when I pace back and forth while I talk. I guess it kind of keeps my brain going. So, so I'll tell you that kind of up front. But I want to kind of go a little bit into the background, kind of into why we have the beginnings of the amendments to the Constitution in the first place. Uh, very interesting thing. If you kind of look back, does anybody happen to have a copy of the Constitution with you? So you got some pocket copies with you? Great, great. Uh, if you do, then uh, kind of turn back to Article 7. If somebody has Article 7, you can get to it pretty fast. If you don't mind, kind of zero in on Article 7. If somebody would be so kind, if you don't mind, they can read it out loud to us and tell us what Article 7 of the Constitution says. A little interactive stuff to bring the audience into it. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Go ahead. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Article 7, the ratification of the Convention of Nine States shall be sufficient for the establishment of this Constitution between the states so ratifying the same. Done in the Convention by a unanimous consent of the states present. <coughs> 17th day of September in the year of our Lord, 1787, and of the independence of the United States of America, the 12th, and witness thereof, we have here, we have here under subscribed our names. Great, thank you, sir. I appreciate you doing that. Great introduction. Article 7, the last article of the Constitution before we get the Bill of Rights, has a couple of things that's significant about that article. I'd like to point out. First thing is, let me ask you all this. We'll make it kind of an interactive thing. There's one thing in particular that's mentioned in that article that's not mentioned anywhere else in the Constitution. Does it jump out at you after the reading of it? The United States, that's exactly right. It does establish that it takes nine states to establish the Constitution. And basically, the founders, if they weren't going to get nine states, the United States refused to ratify it, they're going to scrap the whole idea. Let's go back to the drawing board. Now, but also, that is the only place in the Constitution which mentions God. Interesting part about that. And we'll go into that a little more in Article 1, or excuse me, Amendment 1, just a minute. But Article 7 is the only place in the Constitution which mentions in the year of our Lord, 1787. So that's one issue made by Article 7. The other thing about it, it says there's going to be nine states, the United States will establish this, and then it goes into effect. If eight states ratify the Constitution, it's not going to go into effect. Okay, they're going to scrap the whole idea. If nine states did it, it's going to go into effect. But for who? All 13? No, just the nine. Because every state is bound by its own voluntary act. Madison made that clear in the Federalist Papers. Well, by the way, I, I refer to the Federalist Papers a lot. There's a lot of citations we can use for the Federalist Papers, things we want to bring out. But I have a copy of the book at home, which you have a copy back here, of Ralph Ketchum, the Anti-Federalist Papers. Uh, does anybody have a copy of that book, the Anti-Federalist Papers? That's a good one to have because it's really just as important. The Anti-Federalist just didn't get as much attention because the Federalists were arguing for ratification of the Constitution. The Anti-Federalist Papers is great to have. It's got a great speech in there by Patrick Henry. Because, of course, Patrick Henry opposed the ratification of the Constitution. And that takes us back to that nine state thing. When nine states ratified it, only the states that ratified it didn't go to effect. And, of course, as y'all well know, there are all um, history aficionados and experts. And so you know your Revolutionary War history. And you know that two states refused to ratify the Constitution initially. Carolina and Rhode Island decided to stay out. And when they did, they were treated basically as not part of the Union. They were treated as foreign countries because they had not chosen by their state to stop the solitude to the state, and the states did not choose to ratify it. Now, when United States
states dig it, a seed to the document, which is of course the opposite of the seed. They seeded the document or ratified it, and it went into effect. Seven states said, okay, we'll ratify, but we've got some serious reservations. Like I said, there was some big time major league components of the Constitution. Patrick Henry was one eminent example. But of course, in South Carolina, one of my favorite revolutionary war heroes, Thomas Sumter, Sumter argued against ratification of the Constitution. And of course, he voted against it. Sumter voted against ratification of the Constitution. He was fearful of this centralized government idea. Very fearful of that. Now, I want to come back to that theme as we go through these amendments, because that's something that continues to pop up. Now, seven of these states, seven of the nine, they voted to ratify. Seven of them were really weary, reluctant. And so what they said was, we're going to do it on the condition that you give us a bill of rights. Because we're worried about this central government. Obviously, these men had just fought this brutal, bloody war. As you pointed out, all how bloody it was, especially in South Carolina, against a centralized, powerful empire. The last thing they wanted to do is institute one here. Uh, one line that Mel Gibson put out in the movie Patriot was pretty good. You know, when he's sitting there, he said, Why should I exchange one tire at $3,000 to play with 3,000 tires for my own? And of course, the point is, exactly, you have a centralized government that's a despot just as quickly here as you can across the ocean. And so that's what these men were afraid of. So seven of the states said, You're going to have to do something to give us a bill of rights. You're going to have to go further and guarantee our authority, guarantee the state sovereignty. Guaranteed the freedom of the people. Now, Madison, Madison was against the Bill of Rights. We talked about that probably before. Y'all read something about that. You know, the reason why is because Madison said, look, the purpose of this Constitution is to restrict, to chain down the federal government. Why do we need to clutter things up by saying, you have this right, and you have this right, and you have this right? Why do we need to this thing? You have every right that you didn't give up. You're still a free man. The states are still sovereign. Nothing's taken. These are restrictions on the federal government. Why do we need to this list? Because inevitably, if we start making a list, we're going to leave something out. And so Madison and his foresight realized that, you know, 200 years down the road, there may be some judge that may misinterpret what we're saying. <laughs> Imagine that. And so the last thing I asked them want to do is start listing your rights and your freedoms. Because they're all there. Nothing had been taken. They wanted the United States Constitution to be a short document. And it was supposed to simply limit the federal government. So he was against the Bill of Rights. But seven states were so determined, so, so convinced that we had to have this to guarantee our freedoms that they made it a condition of their application. So, finally, the Federalists agreed to the anti-Federalist demands. They said, okay, you know, we'll agree with Bill of Rights. So they did, they put them together. Now, interestingly enough, Massachusetts and Virginia were two of the big states which demanded the Bill of Rights. That seems kind of odd to us today, especially in Massachusetts, that they would have demanded the Bill of Rights, since they, they typically have kind of come down the side of strong, centralized federal power. Massachusetts was one of them, and so was Virginia. They demanded it. They led the seven, as a matter of fact. Now, three states went so far as to say, you know, another thing about our ratification that we're going to condition it on is we're going to make it clear and explicit that we can leave this union if we choose to. Does anybody know off the top of the head those three states were? What's that? I'm sorry, I just need to know. Two of them? Yes, South Carolina. Okay, good, good, good yes, South Carolina. What did you say, sir? New York and Rhode Island. New York and Rhode Island are two of them. Who's that? Virginia. New York, Rhode Island, and Virginia explicitly made it clear that they would reserve the right to secede if they didn't like the way things went. Nothing unusual about that. They had the authority to accept it or reject it. So all they were doing was making the point that, hey, if this doesn't work out, it's a contract. 
who ever heard of a contract that you, you know, goes on to infinity? So they were saying, okay, this is a contract agreement. It sounds great. Let's work together. But to make things clear, we can leave if we want to. So those three states explicitly put it in their ratification documents. And certainly not to say that South Carolina had an issue with that. And South Carolina agreed, but they just felt like it was a given. There was no need to come out and say explicitly. Those three states went further. And so that shows you the interest and the importance they had, particularly the Bill of Rights. Okay? So it was good. Now let's go into it, and there's some things we want to bring out. There's some things that are current, germane, that I think are significant. So let's go into the First Amendment and talk a little bit about that and bring out a few things that are going on. Now, obviously up front, we know some basic stuff about the First Amendment. Okay? It gives you a freedom of religion. That's the second reference to religion, not in the original Constitution, but the second time it's referenced in the document, the First Amendment. Freedom of religion. Okay, now the purpose of that was to ensure that the federal government did not interfere with religion. That was the whole purpose of that. Uh, and at this time, about every state still had its own official state church. The founders had no issue or no problem with an official state church. Um, by the way, does everybody here know what the official South Carolina state church was at this time? It was the Anglican Church, the Church of England. And so it was supported by state funds. The founders saw no issue, no conflict with that because it was going to the state level. What they did not want is an official national church like England had. had. So while the Church of England may have been the official state church of South Carolina, it wasn't the official national church of the United States of America. And that was the purpose, of course, of the First Amendment. Again, the constructions that many judges have put on the First Amendment in terms of religion would astound the founding fathers. Would be completely blown away by the interpretations of most of them, a number of federal judges have put them. Then, of course, we've got the free speech issue. We'll come back to that in just a minute. Freedom of the press, peaceful assembly, the right to petition the government for address of grievances, all basic individual freedoms that we all take for granted as Americans, most of them are right there in the First Amendment. Now, let's talk about freedom of speech, go back to that a little bit. Freedom of speech, you can kind of break down. Um, into a couple of questions. Never has it been permissible under the Constitution to say anything you want, anytime, any place. That's never what freedom of speech has ever meant. You can a classic example, of course, is you can't yell fire in a crowded theater. You don't have the right to do that. Because, of course, there's a safety concern. And we'll come back to safety concern in just a minute. So there's always been restrictions. The purpose of the freedom of speech aspect of the First Amendment was to protect opinions. The real purpose there was to protect political opinions. You should never be in fear of prosecution or persecution because of your political viewpoints. That's the purpose of the First Amendment. So it doesn't mean you say anything you want anywhere. As a matter of fact, it kind of boils down to a couple of things. Time, place, and manner. It depends on when you say it, where you say it, and how you say it. You have stronger freedoms when you publish a book than you do maybe speaking on stump somewhere to crowd people. And so there's always been restrictions and levels of freedom of speech. But opinions should never be touched. Now, this has become a major, major issue. And Alan touched on it a minute ago. The interesting thing that's coming up about, as I understand it, and I don't know a lot of the details, Alan, you probably know more the details than I do, coming up November the 10th is the dedication of the new monument in Abigail. Uh, and uh, it's supposed to be a big thing. It celebrates uh, the, as I've heard, the secession monument and uh, South Carolina secession. A lot of founders and the signers of the Ordinance of Secession, the monument's going to go up. As you all know and are well aware, since I probably spoke to you last, what has really increased in this country is the tax on monuments, which is such a big issue now. It's become a bigger and bigger issue. Uh, it started out as a tax particularly on Confederate monuments, but y'all notice how the issue is really large and the number of everything. It's everywhere. It's almost like an attack on monuments, an attack on the past. The danger there is if you don't allow 
allow freedom of speech, which the law must represent, if you condemn everything because you think that it, even if the majority of people, which the majority of America does not, the majority thinks that something doesn't represent the truth now, it's still part of history. And if you remove that, if you take away people's freedom of speech that's been up in the past, the danger is you're encouraging lawlessness. And this is something that's really been uh, a, a problem that's developed in the freedom of speech issue. And so what the founders would say would be very, I think, very clear. They would say, you know, people, these are public monuments uh, to destroy all these lawless. And, um, you know, these are opinions people may not agree with, perhaps. But you can't just tear things down that you don't agree with. And so that's the purpose of this, is to protect people's freedom of speech. The founders would say, look, let people say whatever they think. And if their ideas are not popular, they won't catch up. Okay? In other words, it's what my old law professor used to refer to as the marketplace of ideas. Submit it to the marketplace of ideas and let people see it. If they don't like the idea, they don't follow it. But people have a right to express it no matter how ridiculous. So that's kind of the occurrence of the First Amendment, and especially, particularly, the freedom of speech issue. Now, the question yes, sir. We're seeing it now. Good, good, good now. Since Congress shall but it doesn't say the owner of social media can block free speech. And there's a lot being said now about should Congress get involved with social media to make sure that, that free speech is available through social media. That concerns me more than anything, but Congress getting involved with social media. That's right. And I think you bring up an interesting point. I guess, I guess our fear is start bringing in a lot of rules and regulations, it can easily be turned on the other way. You know, it can be used to restrict freedom. And so it's, uh, it's a dangerous concern. And, um, and certainly the purpose of the Constitution is, again, like you pointed out, to chain down the federal government. That's the goal of it becomes the purpose. You know, you can get in later into the corporation doctrines that come after the Court of the States and the federal courts have said about the 14th Amendment issues like that. But the purpose was to restrict the federal government. And so it's an issue where private entities, even big companies, and, and social media, you know, if someone's owned by, by a big company, they can basically do what they want if they own it. They're, they're a private individual, and they own the popular, but it just is sort of an incentive for the marketplace to kind of put its way around that. And I think that's a good point, something you have to think about. And you know, something you bring up another interesting point. Sometimes emotional issues seem like good ideas at the time can be dangerous legally. Um, I'll take a little digression. I'll take a story about that. I heard a story one time, and y'all may have heard it, about David Crockett. David Crockett was in Congress, and he said he was out campaigning for the election, and of course his campaign was to go out and just talk to people, talk to people in his district. And I've heard this story many times, I don't know if it's true or not, but he said that when he was in Washington, serving Congress, there was a, a bad fire one night, and it took down the whole block of houses and tenant houses. And so David Crockett got out there with a bunch of other people, including other congressmen, and they actually got out there and tried to help rescue people, get their things out of the houses, the house was burning, they wanted to save lives. And so after it was over, somebody made a motion that they spent some money to help the people who had been thrown out of their homes. And so David Crockett voted for it. Because he said, you know, these people are homeless, they need some help, you know, this type of thing. Somebody made a motion, a very emotional pull, these people are homeless. So they appropriated some federal money to help these people who get burned out of homes. When he went back to campaign, he'd come across a farmer one day who was plowing, and he thought he knew the guy pretty well, he supported him in the past, and he went back and talked to him, stopped at the fence, and waited until the guy got near him, his mule was plowing. The guy got over there, and he wouldn't speak to him. And so, they probably was kind of surprised at this, and so he waited there a minute. He kind of waited, got in another round, so he waited, the guy came back, and finally, finally kind of got his attention. The guy came over there, and he didn't really want to talk. And finally, they probably said to him, is there something wrong with my feet? you bring in some way? And he said, well, I'm not going to vote for you again. And he just kind of took him back, and he said, well, well tell me why. You know, he, you know, he's an honest guy, a hard worker, you know, he's a good storyteller, and you know, what can I do? 
do. My God, I need you to support me for it. And the guy said, well, listen to that video that you voted for that appropriated federal money to help those people burn down those houses. This blue day dropped the money. He said, all the things he figured it was something else. He said, well, Frank, what the did I do wrong? Why did that offend you? He said, that wasn't your money. He said, if you had wanted to go to the of your pocket and give money to help those people, that would have been a noble effort, and I would have called you for it. He said, but you voted to give our money to do that, and that's not your money to use. And David Crockett's talks in his story he said, if you leave the way, he said, no, you're right. He said, I got called in the emotion. He said, I wanted to help you, people. they need help. He said, well, y'all better help back your pocket. You could have raised money. You could have done, you could have done any number of things. That's the money that belongs to people. And you don't have the authority to that the Constitution doesn't allow you. And so Crockett realized, he said, you know what? You're right. I made a mistake. And I'm going to correct it. And so I don't know how the story went on from there. He said he was going to try and fix it and straighten it out. He was going to go on and do something different. The point was, is it a good thing to help the people that need help? Of course it was. He had the authority to take money to do it. So, in so many times, emotions seem like something that seem like a good idea, but it may not be. And it may set an awful precedent for the future. So, it's a good thing to keep in mind. That's why the founders put these rules in place. You know, and, and government, the mechanism of government which exercises power, these are not suggestions, these are rules. And they have to be. So let's take a little quick look. I want to point out something here about the Second Amendment. And I want to kind of do it by demonstrating the police power. I want to talk to you a little bit about the police power. Now, I don't know if we've gone into this. I don't know if I've ever gone into this in front of a revolutionary museum before, but I want to define police power for you. I want you to keep some words in mind as we do this. When I say the police power, don't think about the guys wearing blue and having blue flashing lights drive like a black and white vehicle. That's not what we mean. Police power is the power of local governments to regulate. It's a very strong power, and it's a power that generally is seen as a state and local function, not a federal function. And the power of police power is, is to regulate for order, health, safety, welfare, and morals. That's what police power is. It's the local governmental power to regulate words, like I said, order, health, safety, welfare, and morals. And that's where a lot of this comes in. Okay? Now, we'll talk about back to the police power, but first let's talk a little bit about the Second Amendment. The Second Amendment, as we know, guarantees the right of the people to keep and bear arms. Now, I had uh, I have heard the argument many times that you know, this simply means uh, military and police can carry arms. In fact, uh, there was a fellow that I heard who was a very distinguished legal, legal mind who argued this point one time. He said, that's what it means. It doesn't mean that people have the right to bear arms. But that's not what it means. The Second Amendment it means that you, the individual citizen, has the right to bear arms. And all you have to do to look at that is to look at what Madison said in Federalist 46. That was before the Second Amendment was written. Federalist 46 makes it clear Madison says that Americans possess the right of being armed, which is an advantage they have over most of the kingdoms of Europe. The point he's making is they have the people to keep the bear arms. And they use the word militia. Now, another thing is words change in meaning over time. And the interesting thing about that is a lot of people think, well, you know, what's a militia? Well, militia does nothing more than citizens usually armed, enforcing the law. And so when the founders used that word, that's what they were talking about. They would use the word interchangeably. They wanted the people to bear arms. And they felt like that would be protection, if particularly against a standing army or regular military. And so militia is what they were really focused on. Militia units were local officers. Again, the protection of the states, which is what the anti-federalists wanted. Now, the third, third amendment, uh, third amendment, of course, seems kind of strange to us today because.
because none of us have ever experienced in our lifetime, I don't think, um, certainly not here in America, soldiers being forced to be quartered in our homes. But this was certainly a problem at the time of the Revolution. The British freely did it. Demand that people put up soldiers to give them places to stay. And of course, that happened frequently here in the old twin states. And the Union Army came to the South that was set up headquarters, and officers would take people's homes to have their headquarters. So this was an issue at this point in time. And so that's why it's put in there that people cannot be made to order soldiers in their home without their consent. And so that's something that we've come to recognize as just a typical, characteristic American freedom, thanks to the Third Amendment. Now, the Fourth Amendment. The Fourth Amendment is something I, the Fourth, the Fifth, and the Sixth in particular are amendments that I deal with every day in my job as a criminal court judge. Uh, I signed a number of search warrants today and yesterday, which I do every day, and the search warrants must comply with the Fourth Amendment. If the government local government, in other words, the local or state government, which has the police power, feel like they need to search a premises for a criminal, or they think there's probable cause, there's a criminal there, or a crime's been committed, they can do it. They can search it. You don't have to get permission. But they have to jump through a number of hoops to protect you against the police state. Okay? So the Fourth Amendment is clear. No reasonable searches and seizures. Okay, and in order to be reasonable, the search warrant must state with particularity the thing to be searched and the thing to be seized. And so every time I look at a search warrant, I did it today, it has to be so, so particular as to what is being searched that it has to have directions on it to where I can drive to that location. You can't just say, look, 355 Elm Street, Spartanburg, that won't get it. They have to put on their descriptions of the premises, how you get there, because the Constitution requires particularity. And, and I'm, a, I'm a judge in Sparkler County, and it's, it's impressive the agencies that I see come in on how particular they are to make their search warrants and to comply with the Fourth Amendment. And then they also go in great detail as to what they're looking for. And then they have to go in and explain what evidence demonstrates to them that they may find evidence of crime. So the Fourth Amendment is, I think, very important. Law enforcement protects us from these unreasonable searches and seizures. Absolutely a big thing. Now, the Fifth Amendment, the Fifth Amendment, of course, yes, sir. What the police are going to go next door and make them in their house? Sir, I'm sorry. If they're supposed to go next door and they come in your house and stuff, do you have any rights to say you need them You do. Do under South Carolina law, um, a citizen has a right to resist an evening or arrest up to and including death. So it can get awfully dangerous to try to do that. I wouldn't recommend it necessarily, but the law of South Carolina says that a person can resist an illegal arrest up to killing the officer. That's South Carolina law. Now, I wouldn't advise anybody to do that because it's a good, good way to get killed. Okay? But you have the right to resist the legal arrest. I, I heard a story one time which illustrated that for me. There was a gentleman who'd been fishing all day, caught a bunch of fish, and he was at home that afternoon cleaning the fish in his backyard. Nobody around with this man. He had, he had his knife out, he was cleaning the fish, and nobody was anywhere around. The officers come to execute a, either an arrest or a search warrant, and they miss the wrong house. I don't know where this took place. I don't know if it was some uh, local. Uh, I think it was a uh, no judge told me this story, so I can't remember where it took place. But anyway, they got the wrong house. And here's a guy cleaning his fish, and all of a sudden these guys come around the side of his house and pull the guns on him and say, "Draw the knife." You can imagine what this guy thought. He's been fishing all day. He's not done anything wrong. He's in his own yard. And they come around here thinking, this guy, I mean, maybe he's a fella, maybe they got a rest warrant, they got the wrong house. And this guy's armed. And they tell him to drop the knife. Okay? Fortunately, in this particular instance, as I recall, nobody died. But you can imagine this homeowner, this citizen, this free man said, he probably would, I would probably have to say, you know, I don't, 
a Southern Baptist, I'm a Christian. Uh, I wouldn't want to use an expletive, but if somebody pulled a gun on me on my land, I might be inclined to use a gun. I'd say, who are you? <laughs> and what are you doing holding that gun at me on my own property? Uh, and uh, so I don't know exactly how it worked out. I think it did work out. But you can see that we're out in a very, very dangerous situation. So if you're nice and you do what they say and all that good stuff, and it's a pile of crap, what is your redress? Well, that's you, you make an excellent point, and, and that, that of course is what I, you know, I think is the law of order recommendation. Is it, you know, and, and I deal with a number of police officers every day, and I have got to, I've got to say, all of them that I have ever dealt with, with the ex exception of maybe one or two of my entire career as a judge. I mean, let's face it. Any career has bad people. Right. Okay, it doesn't matter. Oh, yeah. Good people have bad days. Absolutely, exactly. Yeah, you know, and, and you're going out and you got bad carpenters, you got bad lawyers, <laughs> you know, are you going to have some bad cops? Yeah, of course. But uh, almost every officer I've ever dealt with is very professional, uh, very um, careful. Uh, they want to dot all their I's and cross all their T's appropriately because they lose in court if they don't do it right. Uh, so, but if, if there is a situation that comes up, um, probably the best, most peaceful, mature thing to do is to do what the officer says and if, and that way to avoid any type of issue. And then if what he's done is wrong, then you've got your judicial options, you know, you've got your legal options. If, if uh, because you're still a citizen and you have your rights, your rights must be protected. Uh, but in that particular instance, probably the wise thing to do is to do what you're told, even as, as distasteful as it might be. Uh, for example, in, this, in that particular scenario, the man may have laid a knife down, asked some questions, and then they were able to quickly, you know, uh, figure out the situation, find out what the problem was. But, uh, Sir, you would have turned around quickly as well. Could have been a very bad situation. Very bad situation. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right. Something that's been in the newspaper for a while. Uh huh. The person's driving down 985. It's pulled over by the police. They see he's got $25,000 in the back seat. Now, once they arrive at the they don't have a weapon, but they do. And the thing that's been in the paper is, that this, is, this kind of money has actually been used to support local government. What's your response to Well, do I, I shoot the cop? If that's me, <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't recommend that. <laughs> the, uh, um, and of course, I give you a caveat too. I mean, you know, uh, I'm, a, I'm a judge, not a lawyer, so I can't give you legal advice. Uh, but I'm just, I'm just basically trying to take the state law as, as I see it. And of course, it, you know, it, a lot of it also depends on the jurisdiction you're in as to what local courts have said about those particular issues. Unless it's a federal question and, and uh, it can vary depending on the judicial circuit you're in, kind of exactly how it's dealt with. Uh, and we'll get to that in just a minute to talk about taking some laws. I can show you how that differs depending on whether it's a state court or federal court. Uh, so, Probably the best thing to do is, um, you know, if you're a law-abiding citizen, ultimately, you know, you have nothing to fear. Uh, of course, you know, people say there's all kinds of uh, things that happen all the time, and there were law-abiding citizens at the time of the revolution too. Law-abiding citizens wanted to be loyal, um, loyal subjects of the British Empire until they realized that they couldn't, and they were forced to come out and. Spain, as we know, you know, ultimately if you can't work those things out, what always happens is wars result. And that's where those kind of things happen. But um, yeah, you know, there's all types of things that happen on a, a road stop situation. You know, there's what's called the plain view doctrine. You know, uh, officers have the authority to seize evidence if they see evidence of a crime in plain view. These are exceptions to the search warrant rule. Um, there's a number of exceptions to a search warrant. If, uh, if officers come to a house and they have a search warrant and they hear and they knock on the door and the search warrant allows them to search for, let's say, illegal drugs, they come to the house and they knock and they hear people 
scuffling around inside, side and saying, quick, you're good. I mean, I mean, they might keep the door in, <laughs> you know, because their sounds like there's evidence being destroyed. So there's certain exceptions to the search warrant where evidence is being destroyed or if, it, or if a crime is taking place. Uh, for example, if an officer sees, hears gunshots, he's standing here at the bank, the guy comes running out holding a bag of money with a mask on, he didn't have to stop and go to a judge and get an arrest warrant. You know, he can pursue the guy because there's probable cause that probably a crime taking place. So there's exceptions. Generally, though, you know, there needs to be some evidence of a crime before there's a search warrant or an arrest warrant issue. And that's the general rule. And of course, there's all types of variations, but that, that gives us some, some guidance to go a little bit along with the question you um, asked. Um, typically, in South Carolina, what is generally the case if you have an officer pull somebody over the traffic stop is you know, they, they generally ask for three things. You know, your driver's license, your proof of insurance, your registration. Those are the three things that they're looking for usually in that security that they're about to ask for. But um, there's always exceptions. Um, if you have, for example, um, officer pulls somebody over the side of the road, generally those are the three things they ask for. But let's say the car's been weaving for a mile, and he finally pulls them over, and they roll them down, and there's a strong odor of alcohol, and they have one of shot eyes. Well, it's going to go to something else. He's going to ask him to step out of the car because he suspects a crime. So there's all kinds of issues, factual situations we're going to play. Now, the Fifth Amendment, though, does give you lots of protections. You have a right to remain silent. We know that. The Fifth, everybody's heard that from any time you've ever watched a pop and rob or TV program, you've always heard people recite, you have a right to remain silent. All true. Okay, everybody's right to remain silent. And I tell people that in court all the time. So you don't have to testify if you want to. You can if you like. It's up to you. If you do, I'll be happy to hear from them. And so people have a right, they don't have to say anything. Uh, as a matter of fact, if somebody's on trial, they can sit there stone faced and never make a never make a response to anything because people don't have to prove their innocence. Now, this is an interesting issue. This up is very current. What are we talking about right now? What's the big issue is dominating the headlines right now? <laughs> Yeah, the Supreme Court nominee. It's, it's, this goes back, the founders did not invent this. This was British law, this goes back to Roman law. In fact, I wish I could remember it, I heard Mark Stein today on radio, he quoted a verse out of Acts, the book of Acts in the Bible, I can't remember the chapter, but even Roman law was said that you don't have to prove your innocence. You have to say, oh, yeah, you sit there and look, it's like you want to. He don't want to be approved. And that's why you have a right to remain silent. And if you've been tried for something one time, you can't be tried for it again. It's over with. It's double jeopardy. But that only applies in the same jurisdiction with the same crime. Now, also, the Fifth Amendment guarantees your due process of law. You have to have been guided by a grand jury. You have to have been arrested on an arrest warrant to be able to go to court. Has to have a judge to prove probable cause or a grand jury before somebody even has to face the state in a prosecution. Now, the other interesting thing about the Fifth Amendment is the takings clause. The takings clause allows the government. Can the government take your property? Yeah. Narrowly. It only it cannot be taken for public use without just compensation. Okay? That's the takings clause. Public property, private property, should not be taken for public use without just compensation, which means as always traditionally meant fair market value. So the government can't just come in and say we're going to confiscate your property. I have a good friend who um, was born in Cuba in 1950 and uh, he also was, was a former judge. And uh, so when he was nine years old, Castro came to power, and he's told some horrifying stories about when Castro came to power and how he brought his parents' property, their land, and their property was all confiscated by Castro. So uh, these are things that happen all over the place. And 
that happened throughout the district court, just because people have power, because we have power for us, is what we're actually saying. So these protections protect you. You can't just come take your property unless it's for public use and you've been paying for it. Those are requirements. Now, the Sixth Amendment, other very important criminal protections, the Sixth Amendment in particular gives you your right to an attorney. And that's something that I start every day in criminal court with. So I start off first by reading the rights to everybody in the courtroom. As soon as I come in, it's the first thing I do. And I do it for the whole courtroom before I would start with an individual case. And I say, I want to go over the rights that you have. You have the right to an attorney or a public defender. You have the right to be guilty or not guilty. And I go into a family guilty or waiving the right to trial. And of course, going any further and saying that this could be fine and five hundred dollars in prison for thirty days. You can choose to be not guilty, a speech trial or jury trial, with all those bases. Okay. But you have a right to an attorney. That is a big part of the Sixth Amendment. Okay, so the Sixth Amendment is where that comes from. Also the Sixth Amendment gives you your right to a jury trial in a criminal case. People can always request a jury trial. One of my one of my favorite duties uh, which, of course, is a dramatization, but it's one of my favorite movies. Uh, if you talk to people, and, and I noticed this when I taught college, fewer and fewer people knew what I was talking about. I said this. Y'all remember the 1973 original movie, Walk and Talk, about Hubert Buster, the sheriff? Okay. One of my favorite movies. Uh, that first one was Joe Don Baker, who's playing uh, Sheriff Buster. And, of course, they've got this really dramatic scene there. He's actually um, a victim of crime. And of course, he goes back. Everybody remembers the Buster's big stick. He goes back, and gets his money back, gets his restitution essentially. Well, he's arrested. Uh, there's a corrupt administration of law enforcement in the county at the time, and so they put him on trial. And so, what does he do? He can't get a jury, he can't get justice in the system. So, he demands a jury trial. A jury owns the ears, and the jury acquitted. And everybody knows the story from then on. So, he was acquitted, he ran for sheriff, and won. Of course, that's where his law enforcement all came from. The legend goes on from there. So a jury trial is a very, very important part of your freedom. Because you can always submit it to their friends and their neighbors. Not have to worry about being judged by a judge or law enforcement professional government officials. Um, Seventh Amendment. The Seventh Amendment is rather interesting because uh, a lot of people do not think a lot about it today because it basically guarantees you your right to a jury trial in a uh, civil case. And, and the Constitution says anything over $20. Well, that would be anything now. But in, that would have been about $500 to it in 1787. So at that time, that's basically what they were thinking this at $20. But it basically guarantees the right to a jury trial in a civil case. The Eighth Amendment is uh, it's always uh, a good one. Because, of course, the Eighth Amendment protects people against torture. Okay, no cruel and unusual punishments. Now, the um, Supreme Court's gone back and forth in their interpretation of this over time. They've actually said, you know, it means for a while, in the 1970s, they said it actually made it difficult for the Constitution. Then they changed that back and said, no, you can do that again. But, uh, of course, it's got to be done a certain way. Have y'all heard about uh, the death penalty in the kind of in South Carolina the last year, a couple of years? It's been on, you know, every state's going to this legal rejection mode of execution. You know, the drugs have been almost impossible to get. It's a whole lot of the executions that can't get the drugs. You can't get the death for them. And so, basically, what they've done is that the legislature has voted to go back and start using the electric chair. Because they don't need the drugs to do it. I don't think anybody's been executed in the last year or two, but that's the process that we're going to go to. And I think there's still actually a couple of states that still officially hang people, but they're still a public. But the death penalty, not considered cruel and unusual per se, it depends on how it's done. But torture is, of course, uh, outlawed. Now, again, a characteristic of American freedom, we all come from self, is just standard. But this would have been a big fear of the people at the time of the founding fathers, okay? Colonial period. Because back then they were a little tarred up people back then. Imagine that. Imagine being covered in tarred feathers. So 
so or, or put it in stocks, okay, or put it on a rack, okay, get stretched on a rack. Um, all these things were possible to happen. And uh, how many of y'all have ever gone to Charleston and toured the old uh, Prolux Mansion, Customs House? Everybody down there to with that? Been in the dungeon? See that? Uh, if you've not gone, you should go tour it because it's the last building the British built before the Revolution. And when the tide comes in, water starts coming up and flowing. Because they built it out over where the Ashley and Cooper come together. And so you can see that water starts bubbling up in there. And so, you know, we chain people down there at times. You get chained up. If you were chained up, you didn't get bathroom breaks, you didn't get away from the rats, you didn't get, didn't get away from the rising water. And so the Eighth Amendment is very, very important to protect the people from fortune. Now, the Ninth Amendment goes back to what Madison's concern was. It goes back and says, that, hey, just because we're listing your freedoms here, that doesn't mean that these are the only ones. And that addressed Madison's concern that if you start listing them, you'll forget something. So that's what the Ninth Amendment's all about. And then the Tenth Amendment, very important, to come back to the police power, which we talked about a few minutes ago. The Tenth Amendment preserves the police power of the states. That's why law enforcement is traditionally a state and local function. That's another thing that addresses the concern that you mentioned a minute ago, and I think the founders had, that anytime you give people authority to arrest or restrict people's freedom, you have to be careful about how that's done. And so the founders felt like if you don't allow people to do that, they should be state and local officials. There was traditionally no federal police force. And that would have been far under the founders. So that's, that's well, why like National Guard has the governor has to request the National Guard out of an emergency is goes to that part right there. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Because the states are sovereign, which is exactly what Madison says when he says the states remain distinct and independent sovereigns under the Constitution. And so, yeah, uh, law enforcement is supposed to be a federal a state local function. That's why you elect a local sheriff. That the thinking there of the founders was, you know, that that way the sheriff's closer to the people. It's easier to get to the people know the sheriff more. He's the law enforcement official. He's elected. And it's not some Roman emperor sending his legions in to arrest people you know, you don't know. Okay? And so that's the purpose of that. So the, the law enforcement function is a part of the police power, a state local function. That's why you have municipal city police. County police and state police. We don't have federal police. In fact, the FBI only dates from the late 1920s. And in the early days, the FBI didn't carry guns. They were primarily an investigating agency. And so the purpose of those agencies at the federal level were supposed to be for national protection. Right? So the 10th Amendment is what guarantees the police, the police power remains for the people of the states. It also says that the reserve power, anything not given to feds, is a state function. It just makes that clear. Okay, if we didn't delegate to the federal in this document, then it's obviously a state power for the people keep it. And so there are some things that the people keep it. which they do not delegate or give away to any government. And so those are the three things that we can't remember this. And it's supposed to summarize it. Now, that pretty well did it for everybody and took care of everything uh, for a long time. Uh, the, uh, the next amendments really had to do with a lot of states' rights issues, but they continue to kind of be on the same things. But those, I wanted to bring out more of the Bill of Rights because you can't talk enough about the Bill of Rights, especially when you're seeing things happen and change in our culture today. That's where it really impacts us. So uh, I, won't keep, I won't keep you any longer, but does anybody have any other quick questions or thoughts that you'd like to bring up for? So unlawful search and seizure stuff, why is that not something that I remember seeing in the Bill of Rights? Because I remember seeing that in the Bill of Rights. Well, I mean, it's in the Bill of Rights. Well, 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 it's in the Bill of Rights. Well
administrative and regulatory law. And I had a great professor. Um, a professor I had who would walk around and he helped to carry his pipe with him. And he was a distinguished guy. And he did an excellent job. Very nice fellow. Did a good job in the class. It wasn't, it wasn't his fault that the class was dry as good as. Um, so he was a good professor. But the class was just, he talked about the administrative law. He talked about the bureaucracy and red tape. That is the deal. I read one time that when George Washington left the office of president, the entire federal government was in a filing cabinet. One filing cabinet. That was the federal government. Can you imagine what George Washington would say today if he see the federal bureaucracy? If he could see the IRS. I mean, it no tax on the days from 1913. It's barely 100 years old. Uh, when my granddaddy was born, there was no income tax. And so what's happened is Congress delegates its authority to these administrative agencies to administer these laws. When they passed the uh, income tax law in 1913, which was the amendment, um, they created this agency to administer that. And these agencies exercise quasi legislative judicial power. Now, uh, courts usually defer to the agencies. Uh, and the problem with that is, is you know, Congress tends to say, well, you know, we have oversight of these agencies that control the bureaucracy. But the problem is, you know, how hard it is to control the bureaucracy. So in that instance, the act where you have the redress that you have is to call your congressman. <laughs> call your congressman and say, what are you going to do about this? And if they get enough calls from enough people, that's what they'll do. But it's very difficult to control the agencies once they are turned loose to administer these things. But just like the Department of Defense or any the Department of Justice Department or anything like that, there's, you know, like I said, these agencies were the call founders because they would have said, look, the federal government should be very specific, very small for a particular number of things to be done. Not to dominate the world. Your life every day should not be impacted by the federal government. That's what we found, as we said. But it, um, and it's very costly. Very costly to try and address it. You know, our attorney, but as we all know, it costs a lot of money. Was there another question? Yes, sir. Yeah, um, our family fathers were agreed. I mean, I don't know what they did last year, but I know what they did. Thank you. 
probably I like the founders with this great change. Do you see another thing that's popular now that do you see in Article 2, Section 1, the electoral college of another great idea of the family father? Uh, I, I see overall there seems to be a general attack on our institutions in general. Every uh, so, I see, yeah, I mean, I mean, elections are constantly questioned now. That's, that's a new development which you didn't see before really in 2000. Um, I don't see um, that constitutional amendment get passed because it's just going to be very, very difficult to get a constitutional amendment. You're right. The great thing about the electoral college is, is smaller, more rural states. You know? I mean, if it wasn't the electoral college, then presidential candidates would only go to the urban centers. They'd fly to LA, New York, Chicago, maybe Dallas. And that'd be it. They never come to South Carolina. But the way it's set up, you know, there is a little more protection uh, for the rural and the smaller states. And, uh, and it's sort of it's a nice little buffer. And it's still, and it's still, of course, you know, and, and it still depends on the bands on the popular vote anyway. So, yeah, I think that's another brilliant sign that the founders would do this. But I don't, uh, I don't see that it's, it's going to be, it's going to be difficult for anybody trying to make an amendment to change that or trying to get that to happen. We have to get Congress, you know, to propose about two thirds of the and I just don't think they're going to be thought about to go there. There's none of those things we have to really watch out. Motion is swift. And that's another thing like the founders fear. That's why they stagger the elections. That's why every senator is not up every year. You know, that's why senators have six years and county congressmen have two years. That's the point. Well, the way the electoral college can be undermined is uh, by the states that are proportional uh, to that vote. Their representatives in the electoral college out of vote. So if you have New York, California, a couple of the large states that dominate, turn it over to their, uh, you know, their popular vote. Yes, That's a subtle issue right there. You don't need to do that. Is that a good thing? Is that a good scale? I think the key here, which you're pointing out, and what we've been talking about, and what I want to make this document, the Constitution, is a once in a once in a lifetime brilliant document. You never collect that type of wisdom experience together again. I, you know, and I hate to say that about, about Americans, but these guys first of all could speak Latin, Hebrew, Greek, French, so they understood the meanings of words. They, they chose words, they chose them carefully. That Article 7, which you read a little while ago, uses the word consent in it. They used that word, they chose it for a reason. The states voluntarily created the Constitution. It was voluntary. That's implicit in the word consent. It's voluntary. They chose words they knew. We need to do everything we can as, as Americans, the people who love our history, to protect the document. And that's what our elected officials take an oath to preserve, is the Constitution. If the government violates that constitution, the government's wrong, not the constitution. And that's what we need to remind our elected officials of. Every time you have an opportunity to talk to your elected officials, remind them how important the constitution is. And I think it was really a miraculous, I think it was a, it was a thing that basically God ordained. You put those all what was being there at that time for their experience. And it's just one of those things where, you know, Beautiful document, the oldest in use in the world. And so we have to absolutely be defended and protected and be talked about. It. So it's a great opportunity to talk about it and read the Constitution. Well, I don't want to keep y'all anymore. I've talked to you too long. Thank y'all for having us.